Hi everybody, Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com and danjohn.net. I'm here to talk about programming today. Uh, it's a question that comes up all the time, and I'm going to break it into several parts. Uh, I'm a big fan of programming, obviously, but there's some huge issues when you get into it. So let's begin with, and it depends on which cliche you want to hear, it's either uh, the 30,000 foot view or the big rocks, but let's talk about the big rocks first. So here we go with part one. This is the big vision of things, okay? So when I talk about fitness, I always make sure we have three other words in that discussion. And the first is health. And I use Matthew Tone's definition, and health is the optimal interplay of the human organs. Um, you can win the marathon, but if you have some kind of cancer inside you, you're not healthy. You want a marathon, but you're not healthy. The second word is longevity, and as many of you know, when I give my workshops, uh, I break it into two things, uh, quality and quantity. Now, you know, you could live to be 130 in a coma, uh, but the quality of life might not be very good. So you got to make sure you balance both of those, and that's, that's a big issue as I, as I move into my senior years. Wow, it's hard to say that sentence out loud. But uh, the quality of life issue is very big to me. Uh, in my family, we don't have a lot of quantity. Now, the next word is performance. And that's what I specialize in. I, I'm good at getting people, when their name is called, when they get tapped on the shoulder, they can go in and they can play. Performance is when someone calls your name and you have to step up and perform. Uh, that's why I love going to Broadway and talking to people who danced and sang on Broadway. Uh, they have a little mark you have to stand on, and then that curtain opens, and it's time to, to dance. So performance is what I do. And the final word is fitness, and that's the most confusing of all. Uh, I don't like the definitions of fitness I see anymore. Uh, fitness comes from the original, the old Nordic. Fitness means to knit, to be knitted. And the best way to think of fitness, really to explain it, is to look at what uh, you do with the jigsaw puzzle. The pieces fit. So for me, a well-knitted person is a fit person. I mean, you can have six-pack abs, and you can have the big packs and the deltoids and all that, and be a horrible human being. Uh, there's that one guy who beats his girlfriends and stuff that I, that I just heard about the other day, and it's like, yeah, he might have a six-pack, but he's not a very good person. So, so when I look at fitness, when I look at programming, I want to make sure I balance all four of those for you my client, or for me when I'm coaching myself. And it sounds so simple when you say it, but sometimes you have to make decisions. Like, I know that performance, stepping up and performing, has left me with some issues that really did impact my health in some ways. Uh, when I played high school football, I fell on this elbow and, and broke five pieces off. It is interesting. People watch me press online. They, they'll always say, why don't you fully lock out? And I'll go, well, because that was my lockout for the bulk of my life until I had this really nice surgery that uh, took those five chunks out. I wish I had kept them. I don't know where they are right now. Um, so before we even get started in talking about a program, I want to make sure we're, we're looking at your health. Are you healthy? We're looking at your goals, at performance or fitness. And then are we looking at longevity? Is this going to be stuff that's going to be around for a while? So that's the very first thing I start with. And I have two tools that will help you do that. My two favorite tools for helping people in basically every area of life uh, are shark habits and pirate maps. And let's talk briefly about both. Shark habits comes from Rob Wolf. One bite and it's gone. You'll notice I wear this shirt a lot is because I bought 16 of them. Because that's all they had in my size in North America. Uh, a couple weeks back I found this nice little v-neck shirt that fit nicely on me. So I bought nine of them. Uh, when I buy things, I I buy them and I'm done with it. If you ask me to go to your wedding, I'll look at it. If I can fit it in, it's yes. If, if I can't, it's no. Shark habits. One bite and it's gone. They're not unimportant, but anything that comes to me in a binary choice, I try to answer it and get rid of it as fast as you can. This morning, uh, we woke up. We pulled some chicken out. We had some frozen chicken. And tonight for dinner, I'm going to do that, do this and that, because we have a menu we follow and we stick to the menu. That allows me to keep my brain free to do all kinds of other things. 
So shark habits are anytime you have a chance to say yes or no to anything, choose, get it done. Uh, when people ask me to do podcasts, I answer yes or I answer no. I get right back to them because I don't like things floating around in my head. Every morning I put together my little to-do list, which is right behind here. And when I get up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, I write down my to-do list so that when I, it's out of my head. So when I wake up in the morning, boom, there it is. Shark habits. Now, pirate map's a little bit different. A pirate map comes from Pat Flynn. And Pat tells us that what people want in a training program is this. Go to St. John's Island, find the white coconut tree, take seven paces to the west, dig down, there's a buried treasure. They don't want a 700-page book. So what we put together are these things we call daily pirate maps. Mine starts off, number one, it's last night. My day starts with the night before. I want to get a good night's sleep. So one, I prepare the coffee because I wake up to the smell of coffee. And two, I make my little to-do list. That clears off my head. I wake up to the smell of coffee. I start a great day. Number two, I try to start every day with just a moment of gratitude. And there's a lot to be grateful for. Third thing, I do a daily one-minute meditation from the app One Moment Meditation, free online. I often go up to 15 to 20-minute uh, meditations, but I try to get that one minute every day. Number four is I strive to eat 8 to 12 different vegetables every day. Not servings, just vegetables. Um, I, I do that usually at breakfast. And then number five is my weekly training program to get me to my goal, which is a dance at my granddaughter's wed at wedding. Pretty simple. Those two tools, thinking about things with shark habits and pirate maps, clean up my mind for everything else so that when it comes to life, when I'm at, when I'm out with my daughters and my wife, when I'm, when I'm doing something, I'm totally there. That's part one. Understand health, fitness, longevity, and performance. Think about having pirate maps to support those goals and use shark habits to keep the mind clear from everything else. Part two, fractals. Now, I have recommended for years uh, two books to help you be a better coach. And that's, of course, Jurassic Park and Lost World. And people always think I'm kidding when I say those two books. But the John Malcolm character uh, does some of the best explanations of modern thinking that I found anywhere else in the world. And the discussion on fractals is simple. Now, a fractal is a repeating pattern, basically. Now, the, the, the inventor would probably be rolling his eyes, uh, and I love this book. But basically, uh, a leaf, if you look at it, kind of looks like a tree. A pebble sort of looks like a mountain. Okay, those are fractals, repeating patterns, okay? Uh, there's a lot more to it, but I use them simply. When I'm working with athletes, I tend to have the workouts reflect what we want in the athletic career. I would love it if your last competition of your life was your best by far. I would love it if every season ended on the high note. And I would love it if every performance ended with a high point. So when I train athletes, I try to have the end of the workout reflect that. So there's a couple of ways of looking at this. I, since I'm a discus thrower, I tend to use the way a, a discus accelerates across the ring. So it starts here, it goes a little faster, eases off, and then finishes with everything hitting it once. So when I'm looking at so coaching you for the season, I might say, okay, we're going to train hard, build up, ease off a little bit in the late preseason, and then build up to a big peak. When I look at that in an athletic career, it's like, okay, we're going to have that early, wonderful time where everything just gets better and better. And then things are going to slow down, but it's fine because I told you it was going to happen. And then we're going to improve from there. So when I train someone uh, day to day, we try to have the last throw of the practice, the best throw. Last throw, best throw. So that's the fractal I use when I train athletes. I want you, if you're a, a team sport athlete, to win in the overtime, if we have to. It feels really good to win in the overtime in, a, in, a, in any sport. It's it's amazing feeling. And it's terrible to lose in overtime. So I try to build up your conditioning so you have extra staying power throughout the rest of the game. 
And also, too, when I coach team sports, I like to talk about things like overtimes on day one, winning the game, last-minute stuff. I focus, as Covey once taught us, with the end in mind. But when I work with everybody else, I use a different fractal, and I use the fractal of life. Now, this is going to be a little negative, but it's okay. You know, we start off kind of little, you know, laying around. We start to crawl. We get up on one knee. We stumble back down. We rise up, and then there's this really nice period of life. And then things start to go off a little bit. We stumble and fall a little bit. And then we have this real long time, really, really long time, where we lay around a lot. And in the yoga tradition, we call it savasana. And, of course, uh, it's the corpse pose. Uh, We die. So when I train adults, instead of having finishers with adults at the end of the workout, what I try to do is try to mimic what we're doing there. So when we come in, I spend a lot of time crawling around in the beginning, uh, Tim Anderson's original strength, and then we build up to half kneeling, and then we put in the middle of the workout one of those workouts you find on my YouTube site, the hangover or the humane burpee or something like that. And then after that, when everyone's huffing and puffing, (laughs) then they want to know about correctives. Hmm, let's do some bird dogs. Let's do some uh, hip flexor stretches. And then we have a little bump up towards the end, And then we might do just breathing at the end of the program. So part two is very simple. It is the mental image of how you piece together the day-to-day-to-day-to-day workouts to to season-to-season-to-season-to-season, to decade-to-decade-to-decade, to to lifetime. I think it's important that the daily workout reflect the vision of overall training. I hope that helps. Part three, let's get a little bit specific about programming now. There's three big things when it comes to programming. The first can be called a number of things. I I like repetitions, Uh, but it's also known as continuity. And continuity is a nice name for programming. Uh, It comes from the earliest roots of of what we now do in the modern world, from the work of Thomas DeLorme and Watkins. It's P-R-E, progressive, resistance, exercise. And when I think about progression, I'm much more than just load. I also think in rep structure, I think in sets, but I also think progressive in movement. Uh, I don't think that's unusual, but I really emphasize it more. Um, The second one, of course, is waving the loads. And this is where things get very difficult. I want you to come in and lift weights. Say you're on a five-day-a-week program. I think if you come in five days a week, 365, well, that would be 52 weeks a year for a decade, good things are going to happen to you, okay? That's not exactly deep wisdom. But inside those workouts, we have to have some shifts and changes. And that's where waving the load comes in. And there's three basic terms. The first one, you can you use a calculator to figure out, and that's called volume. And volume really is when you multiply reps times set, sets times load, and you get this number. Well, is there anything wrong with that number? Well, yeah. If you pick up six pounds 100 times, that's 600. If you pick up 600 pounds one time, that's 600. Well, which one was more beneficial? Well, I mean... I'm thinking that the 600-pound deadlift is most beneficial. But, you know, someone could argue, well, you know, we're, we're doing this um, pan aerobics program or some uh, dumbbell program or kettlebell thing, and maybe that 6 times 100 is better. But you listen. You can understand my point. It is hard to measure volume. I always, I always tell people this. I say, if you went to the store and they had 10 pounds for $2, That's a good deal, isn't it? Someone raises their hand, yeah, but 10 pounds of what? And that, of course, is the key to understanding uh, volume. Uh, 600 pounds of what, okay? And the next word is intensity, and that that word used to mean something, but it really, of all the words that I can use in training, intensity is the one that throws most people off. Arthur Jones argued intensity is when you fail on that last rep. Okay, Uh, those people from the workout that shall not be named, 
think that when you puke in a bucket, that's what intensity is. As a lifter, people show you all these intensity tables, and it makes sense when you first do them, until you realize that intensity, your max really does depend. My gym max is miles different than the last attempt at the Nationals max. Uh, my students at St. Mary's learn this lesson very quickly when we do that Olympic lifting day, where they have a competition, and that night they're still buzzing from the tension and arousal levels of a true max, max, max in front of in front of a couple hundred people. Ah, uh, basically intensity. Uh, it might be one of those things that when I hear it, I know what you mean. It's one of those things, and it's hard to define. The last one is density. Now, density uh, is there's there's is nothing new under the sun. It's been around a long time. It's the same amount of work in less time. So this, by the way, track and field, the track side of track and field is pure density. The first time you run the 400 meters, you run 75 seconds. It's 400 meters. The hundredth time you run it, you run it in 45 seconds. Same distance, less time. And there's and it's got, a, it's got an older relative where you do more work in less time, and that's when you really are starting to put things together. So continuity, waving the loads, and then finally, the third one is called specialized variety. Specialized variety is a, is a fancy way of saying same but different. Uh, when it comes to, like, if I'm working with a shot putter, we might do three weeks of bench press, three weeks of incline press, three weeks of decline press, three weeks of military press, and then maybe three weeks of uh, padded bench press, and then go back to bench press again. It's the exact same, basically, but different. Uh, it's very easy in the world of pressing, I think, and pulling uh, to, to have a lot of uh, variation. In hinging, I think there's a lot. In squats, you have the goblet squat, the, the front squat, the back squat, the zercher squat, the overhead squat, some kettlebell variations, but you don't truly have a ton of variations in the squat. And of course, some exercises like the overhead squat, which I think is amazing, has a little, it's going to be a little different. So those are the three big tools. Continuity, waving the loads, and specialized variety. And that's very confusing. And this is why I quote my good friend, Pat Flynn. I love Pat Flynn. He says these three lines and put them to memory as a coach or trainer. Train consistently for progress. You want to get better at Type, typing, type. You want to get better at the cello, play the cello. Life's pretty simple. For progress, train consistently. Number two, add variety for plateaus. And I found this many times in my career, sliding from front squats to which I had done for eight years. And then Dick Notmeyer said, let's do back squats. That broke through all my plateaus. And then later when I took the overhead squat seriously, it changed everything again. And then finally, the, the, the very difficult last words. Add randomness for fun. And you know how we spell fun in American football? W-I-N. Hey, listen, I'm all for people having fun, but no one's going to be around next year because we're all going to get fired if we have too much fun and don't have enough W's. So when I'm coaching athletes, we focus on consistency, consistency, consistency. And that's where that we go back to the pirate map. You're going to throw the discus four days a week and lift three days a week for the next eight years. Consistency, consistency, consistency. Fun? W-I-N, folks. Besides continuity, waving the loads, and specialized variety, there's one other thing I just want to talk about briefly, and that's the area of rest. Now, I've written a lot of articles about rest. And, of course, I always finish off the article with the concept of eternal rest. Trust me, you're going to have a time, you're going to have plenty of time down the line to get all the rest you'll ever need. Uh, I'm, it's, it's weird. I have a love-hate relationship with rest periods. Uh, most of the time, I'm like, why do you need to know rest period? You know, it's, you know, when you feel like going again, go. And if it was so hard, you don't ever feel like going again. 
uh, I make that joke a lot about. Uh, so I did a workout in June of 1979 where I back squatted 315 pounds for 30, 275 pounds for 30, and then 225 pounds from 30. And as soon as I recover, I'm going to do it again. See, that's funny because it was a long time ago. I'm never doing that workout again, ever. Well, kind of what do you mean by rest periods? My favorite way to work rest periods in is working with partners. Uh, I'm a big fan. If it's you and me training, I love that rest period the most. It's called I go, you go. I go, you go. And for an extra a workout like the armor building complex, I go, you go is just about a perfect rest period. How long is it? Uh, long enough for that person to do two cleans, one press, and three front squats. And then I go, and then you go, and then I go. I also like what we did when I was young, and it was called the cohort system. And that's when you have four athletes working with one barbell at the same time. Uh, if I'm bench pressing, I have two spotters here and then the head spotter there. I rack the bar, I stand up, I become a spotter, then a spotter, then a spotter, then it's my turn again. My rest periods are spotting. And, and I think for, for big groups, uh, that is a wonderful way to go. Um, sure, you can also do all kinds of other things like every minute on the minute, which has been around since I think uh, the, uh, the sundial came out. <laughs> it's, it's an old workout. Uh, there's other rep periods. My favorite, my favorite rest period is uh, the three sets of eight workout with one minute rest. So you do a set of eight, one minute rest exactly, a set of eight, one minute rest exactly, and then an as many set. And you, one of the hardest lessons is not basing the weight on how you feel here or here, but how you feel here. And of course, I always say if you do five reps or lower on that last set, you're way too heavy. If you do 11, 12, 13 or more reps is, was probably too light. You want to be in that six to nine-ish range, maybe even 10. It's going, to, it's going to depend, of course, on what the exercise is. Um, with upper body movements, sometimes it's a little harder to jump uh, than, say, lower body movements, so it's up in the air. What I'd like to finish with when I talk about programming is the question I get the most often. Dear Dan, I'm a low-level BJJ, or I'm a, I'm my, my child is a regional tennis player, and uh, my son wants to, you know, and they want to move their children to a sports-specific program. I had the opportunity of having many breakfast, lunch, lunches, and dinners with two world record holders, Yuri Sadiq and John Powell. And Yuri, one time, told us what the Soviet definition of an elite athlete is. And it's, it's actually brilliant. It's subtle, but it's brilliant. An elite athlete is someone who improves every year. Now, in some sports, it's going to be hard to see that. Now, that's why I love track and field and swimming. You can see the marks go up every year. And if the marks stop going up, according to the old Soviet model, you might be in trouble. John said something even more uh, insightful. If you're not world-class within three years of going to one sport, total specificity, I'm going to be a discus thrower, I'm going to be whatever, throw in the sport. If you're not world-class in three years, you're not ever going to make it. That's a tough one because if you got little Billy who's 12, if by the time he's 15, I have never heard of him, or people in that sport have never heard of him. He ain't going to make it. That's why I'm such a big believer in putting off sp uh, sport specificity as long as you can as an athlete. I didn't, I didn't become specific to just the discus until the spring of my freshman year in college. Uh, and even then, I was still Olympic lifting half the year. It wouldn't have been until my senior year where a very odd thing prevented me from Olympic lifting. I got hit in the head with a discus, which is funny to say out loud, but the nice thing about getting hit in the head with a discus is I, I had to change my training completely and I couldn't compete. Uh, the fact that I had a hard time sleeping and, and I don't really remember any of this is another reason. When I look back at that year, that was my first year of total sports specificity. I only threw the discus. For most of us, 
the basics, the most general things in the world are the best, not only for the general population, but for athletes too. It's going to be push, pull, hinge, squat, loaded carry, take care of mobility, <laughs> go for a nice walk, do some sprints occasionally, <laughs> eat vegetables, eat protein, drink your water, get a good night's sleep. Yeah, it's that simple. And only for the thinnest, thinnest edge of the world's population do you need to get more complex. As always, folks, the best place I think you can go is to the workout generator at danjohnuniversity.com. And if you're using it, you have the answers to so many questions. I'm Dan John. Thanks for listening in today.